Hi, thanks. I'm Joe Roman. I'm a fellow here at the Gund Institute and also a visiting professor at Harvard this year. It's nice to be back in um, Burlington hanging with you all. Um, so in uh, 1995, uh, Dan Pauly published this seminal paper on what he called shifting baselines. He's a fisheries biologist based out of uh, University of British Columbia. The idea is that if you're, when you're young and starting out in your career, or even as a, uh, a young ecologist or just observing the natural world, you establish that baseline according to what you see. So I'm not sure how old Bob is, um, but let's say in the 1950s, um, he would have seen an ocean around Long Island, sorry to out you, Bob. Um, but you were around there, okay. He would have seen an ocean, let's say this is Red Drum, for example, so an ocean full of large, abundant fish. If you're raised in the 1980s, I, I would have been established raised on Long Island. I also saw an ocean that seemed normal to me, right? So uh, even though to Bob, the fish would have been smaller and, and more rare. Uh, and then for those of you students now who are just starting out in the field, Monica, I learned you're from Queens as well. So we all grew up in Queens and Long Island, but we saw different places over that time. Uh, Dan Pauly really nailed this idea going forward, this idea of shifting baselines for fisheries published in Tree um, about a generation ago, as it turns out. As it turns out, though, at the same time since the 1970s, across this time, there's also been rising populations as well. So not, the shifting baselines don't have to go down, but they can also lift. And this is the work um, that, that Brendan and I and, and other colleagues just got some funding for through a Gund Collaborative grant to look at what are the levers of conservation success. Marine mammals are a great one. Um, if you grew up in the 1970s, you would have grown up when there were no marine mammals in the ocean almost. They were down to probably 1 to 5% of popula historical population sizes. They've since risen dramatically. Whales, seals are abundant in the oceans. Uh, on the upper right there, you'd see predatory fish. That's the way we'd usually see it. They've declined. Whales and other marine mammals going up. Just to point out one success story, elephant seals, fewer than 100 in 1960, now at 239,000, as many as probably any time when humans first observed them. Incredible success story. So what are the consequences of these changes? One is there are ecological consequences. This is a paper that just came out um, highlighting some of the work that I've done and others looking at, um, Bill mentioned earlier today the idea of forest carbon in Vermont. Well, we don't have forests in the oceans, but we do have fish and we have whales, and that's where a lot of carbon is locked in. Um, whales increase productivity in areas where they're found. This is work that colleagues and I have been doing, what's called the whale pump. They increase primary productivity that can draw CO2 out of the ocean. They also, when they die, the largest animals on the planet, largest animals ever to have lived, when they drop out, they take out carbon, um, and they also create habitat for deep sea species. So that's one of the ecological consequences of the return of these species. What about the social consequences? Well, on the positive side, the benefits, um, whale watching and wildlife observation is improved now that we have marine mammals back on our shorelines. Um, humpback whales, for example, are still increasing at 5% a year, almost exponentially. Where there were probably only a couple of thousand in the oceans, there are now um, tens of thousands. Uh, there's another side to that too, though, and that is when, pop, when species become abundant, when they recover, some people start to view them as nuisance species. So nuisances or pests. Um, California sea lions at the bottom there are one example. Uh, they now number in the hundreds of thousands. And uh, one interview just came out uh, a couple of weeks ago of commercial um, passenger fishermen, um, that is party boats have shown that as these populations go up, there's more pressure to cull them. So there's a pressure on the US government to lethally take out those numbers. Um, at, at the same time, also, we see illegal hunts of a lot of these species. So there was a recent um, shooting of Hawaiian monk seals as these populations come back. So it, to wrap up, 
What I'm looking at now is what are the levers of, this, uh, of these changes um, for conservation. So in the 1970s, we had prohibitive laws such as the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. They've been successful. We're not seeing those laws now. Now we're seeing emergent technologies and markets like aquaculture and community-supported fisheries. Um, are they going to be as effective in the 21st century? That's really the big question going forward is, do we need more prohibitive legislation like that, or can we use market-based technology? Thank you.